Uh, so when I prepared the talk, um, I found that this is a bit of a difficult talk to prepare uh, because this is an abstract framework. And abstract frameworks are very nice for the people who know the instance, specific instances of this framework. Because then you can somehow appreciate the generalization and see that it's a nice uh, theory. Um, but if you don't know the instances, it's sometimes a bit of, okay, there's a lot of formalism around what does it mean, what, why, why this level of generality. Um, so it was a bit tough to prepare, so let's see how I managed. Um, so this is the overview. I'll first talk a bit about uh, reactive systems in the sense of Leifer and Milner. Uh, which is an abstract framework of rewriting. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about the conditions in the title. Uh, I'll define them. I'll relate them to first-order logic. So we had quite a bit of first-order logic. Now, again, a tag on first-order logic. Um, then I'll say what are these conditional reactive systems, and I'll say a bit on the operations and conditions, what you can do with them, how you can manipulate them. Um, and then we also have two applications in this paper. I mean, it's an abstract framework, but it has two applications. Uh, and the first is to compute pre- and post-conditions, and the uh, second is confluence uh, via critical pair analysis. Um, and then I'll conclude. Okay, what are reactive systems? It is an act act abstract theory of rewriting, uh, which was first introduced by Leifert and Milner. There's a Concord 2000 paper. Uh, and it's a general framework it, which encompasses lots of things. So it encompasses term rewriting, process calculi, uh, graph transformation, bigraphs, also invented by Milner. And the original motivation, actually, that uh, Leifert and Milner had when they introduced this framework was to derive labor transition systems, really for process calculi. So the original application was process calculi. And uh, they used this to derive labor transition systems in a fairly general framework, and then also to derive uh, bi-simulation bi congruences and equivalences. So I will not really talk about equivalences here, uh, behavioral equivalences, um, but about the underlying framework. And in this talk, I'll show you how to enrich reactive systems by conditions, making them to con conditional reactive systems. And uh, these conditions control whether a rewriting rule can be applied or not. And um, so we have a huge source of inspiration, which comes from graph transformation systems. And these conditions have been really extensively studied in the context of graph transformation systems. And we show how to lift them to this more abstract setting, and I think it, the, the theory that you get is quite elegant, and especially if you compare it to what has been done for graph transformation systems. There's important work done there, but it's really a bit um, cumbersome. And I think that on this abstract level, it really things become suddenly much simpler and, and much easier to understand. Okay, so first, this is about categories. So I don't really want to frighten you too much, but uh, I mean, I think I'll give you the definition of a category, which is really not too complicated. And I think you really need it to, to understand the rest of the, of the talk. So a category uh, is a generalization of a monoid, in some sense. And uh, it consists of uh, objects, A, B, and arrows between objects. Just think of them as arrows, just arrow. There's no deeper meaning behind it. It's, it's like a monoid element. It also doesn't have a deeper meaning. It's just an element. Um, with the property that there are identity arrows from each object to another arrow, uh, to another object. And there's an associative composition operation meaning that if you have two arrows, one from A to B and the other to B to C, uh, they compose and are using this uh, semicolon for composition. And, um, well, let's say the category that every other category in some kind is trying to imitate uh, is the category of um, sets and functions. Uh, but the categories that we're looking here are um, category of graphs and graph morphisms. So here the objects are graphs and the arrows are graph morphisms that are really uh, very similar to, uh, to Moshe's uh, homomorphism from the last talk. Only here our graphs can have loops, so things are slightly different. Um, then the other category that I'm looking into is uh, the category of graphs and cospans of graphs. And uh, the objects are again graphs, and the arrows of cospans of graph morphisms. That is, we have two arrows, uh, sorry, two morphisms. They should be morphisms. Um, of the form, there's a graph in the middle, and there are two other graphs, J and K which you can think of the interfaces of this graph. So think of it as a graph G, where you identify two subgraphs, J and K, which act as the interfaces of this graph. 
And uh, let me give you a bit more of intuition for this uh, cost span category. So cost spans are graphs with an inner and an outer interface. And composition, you only also need composition to have a category uh, formed by gluing over the joint interface. So we have these two cost spans. And you see that the in, this outer interface and this inner interface are really the, they're the same. So we just glue over this and leave out this uh, interface, and then you get a new cost span. This is how cost span composition works. And let's say this is the category which I will mainly work in. The other category also makes a short appearance at, uh, at some point. OK, in the reactive systems over category C, the arrows are rewritten in the following way. Well, let me show you maybe the definition. Um, so you have a rule which consists of two arrows L and R, starting from some distinguished object zero. Think of it as the empty graph I'm in most cases, um, to, an, uh, to an object I. And the reduction relation is generated as follows. If I put this left-hand side into some context C, which is again an arrow of the category, this is perfectly uh, general, then we can place, uh, replace this by the right-hand side and uh, the arrow C. So in some sense, we're doing prefix rewriting, uh, where the things that we are rewriting are, are arrows of a category. So now you can say, oh, isn't this, isn't this somehow a restriction to do prefix rewriting? It is, in a sense. Um, but let's say one special case that we're very interested in is uh, double push out graph rewriting. And if we instantiate this with the coast bank category, we get exactly double push out graph rewriting. So we get something which is very well known. This is not a result of our paper. This has been known for a while. And uh, why the prefix is okay is basically because you can always rearrange, decompose actually, um, a graph in such a way that the left-hand side comes first and then you have the rest. And then you can cut out the left-hand side and replace it by the right-hand side. Okay, now what is a condition? So condition A is a finite tree where the nodes are labeled with objects and quantifiers. So, I mean, here, for instance, this node is labeled with quantifier for all, object A, and then you have um, the edges of the tree, and on the edges of the tree, you put the arrows, put the arrows of the category, and of course, in such a way that F is an arrow going from A to B, and A is called the root object of the condition. Okay, so it looks a bit first order-like, well, not quite, maybe, and actually, this is quite true. This is more or less a first order led logic, and I will make this more precise in the following. So, just but let's do an example maybe first. Uh, in order to express that a graph, so graphs now we view as co spans, uh, where the middle graph is the graph we want to consider and has an empty inner and an empty outer interface. And we want to express that a graph contains an isolated node F. Here we say something like this. Uh, there exists a co-span in the graph, and this co-span is this one, it's just this isolated node, such that for all ways can continue, we need nothing, so we have an empty universal quantification, uh, which is just two. So this means there exists such an isolated node F, and it really must be isolated because you have no way to glue something to this node. Okay, then I have to tell you how to evaluate a, condi a condition on an error, so they're always evaluated on errors. Uh, if you have a condition with root object A and the error goes from A to B, then I can evaluate uh, or check whether the, the error satisfies the condition. And, um, okay, there are, naturally there are two cases. There's universal quantification, and if you have universal quantification, and uh, here um, this kind of branching in the condition, here there are other conditions sitting, uh, so I require that for every index of these f1 to fn and every alpha such that I compose the c, which is the arrow for which I ask whether the, which satisfies the condition, can you decompose into fi and alpha? We require that alpha satisfies the condition ii, I, which comes afterwards. So basically, for every way of removing such an arrow fi from my arrow, the remaining arrow had assessed to satisfy the condition that comes afterwards. An existential quantification, well, okay, you can guess that now. Um, for every way of decomposing this C into F, one of the Fi and, uh, no, sorry, so there exists a way of uh, composing um, C into Fi and alpha, and uh, for this, 
alpha that we get then, it has to satisfy the condition AI. So um, actually, we compared this with another categorical logic, which we kind of invented ourselves. So maybe this is, might not interest you so much. Um, it's a so-called um, logic on subobjects, and it tries to imitate monadic second-order graph logic in a more categorical setting. Um, and if you restrict to the first order fragment, we get exactly the same logic or the same kind of expressiveness as, as we have here for the conditions. Um, OK, you say, yes, there's two strange logics. but. OK, if you, this logic, if we take as the category, the category of graphs and graph morphisms, now when I'm taking this other category, I get exactly a first order graph logic. So this is something well known. And um, OK, but many examples of the example that comes now doesn't work in the category of graphs and graph morphisms, but in the category of uh, cross bands. And in this category, actually, the logic is more expressive. So we have examples of properties that can be expressed in this logic. Uh, but not in the other logic. Um, OK, so now what is a conditional reactive system? It consists of rules, um, again, just as a reactive system, plus every rule has an application condition sitting on this interface object I here. And then a rule is applicable to an arrow if the arrow can be decomposed as left-hand side plus some context. And uh, the context must satisfy the condition. So we're always evaluating the condition on the remaining context left after removing the left-hand side. Um, and in this case, left-hand side composed with the context is reduced to the right-hand side composed with the context. OK, just a simple rule, maybe to illustrate a bit better what I'm talking about. Uh, this is the dereferencing of a file owned by a user. So there's a user and it owns a file, and it wants to so this own relationship should be removed. Uh, but I can only remove it um, if, for all, if for all protected loops that are attached to the F nodes, uh, there exists an admin node uh, attached to the user node, which means that either the file is not protected, or if it is protected, the user has to be the admin. And this is basically what you can specify. I mean, it's a, Really a first order logic. And OK, that's, I said this before, basically. So conditions really restrict the context in which the rules are applied. OK, now we have to do a bit with these conditions. We need some conditions. And uh, for this, I'm introducing the following thing, which is called the representative class of squares. Now, what is that? Assume that you're two given um, a squ commuting square. Commuting means. If you compose these two arrows and these two arrows, you get the same. And you we say a class of squares is representative if for every commuting square you find inside another of so such representative squares that can be uh, where you have also find an arrow E such that everything here commutes. So inside you find a representative square. So um, in a category, usually take if you need a representative square, you usually take the so-called pushouts. Uh, but now assume that you don't have pushouts, which we don't have actually in our category. And um, so the idea is to find something that, such as for each pair of arrows, A, B, there are only finitely many squares, representative squares. Pushout, there would be only one, but we're happy if they're finitely many. OK, this is not terribly exotic in the sense that this has been studied before. This was a, a real problem in the work of Leifer and Milner, where they generated these label transition systems, uh, behavioral equivalences. Uh, to kind of close these squares. And they came up with the notion of so-called item pushouts. Uh, the definition is not too, uh, too complex. I'll not give it here. Uh, but actually, the implications are very com complicated. Because for the, in the categories you're interested in, not even these item pushouts exist. And then you get into a lot of trouble. And it, there's really a huge amount of work trying to solve this problem, which is connected to somehow very tricky automorphism problems, of course. Uh, then the one way to solve this was the so-called group riddle item pushouts by Sasson and Sobocinski. We also had our own solution, which is the so-called uh, borrowed context diagrams. But um, here we just we don't really say what kind of universal properties these squares should have. We're kind of really trying to avoid the problem and say we just need the pro this representativity property I showed on the slide before, and then things work fine. Okay, now. The operation that I want to do with these representative squares is how to, sh how to shift the condition along an arrow. And assume we have an arrow going from A to B. And then we have 
uh, condition, and then it shifted along the arrow. I can't to show it on this slide, but it's better to show it on this slide. You have this condition, the arrow going from A to B. And now here you have two arrows, and you just take all representative squares here, which could be 0, 1, 2, many. And you close it, then again you have here an arrow and here an arrow, and you can take all representative squares. And then once you're through the tree, it might be um, it might be have a higher branching degree than before, uh, but if you have this finiteness property that for two hours you have only finitely many representative ways to close this square, uh, then the condition that you get will also be finite. And uh, we have the following property. The shift has a nice property. Um, so, I mean, some of the things we're showing here, especially this one, there are similar results in the context of graph transformation system. It just kind of abstracted them to a higher level. And so, so this operation shift has been known there. And it has the following property. If phi C satisfies a condition A, this is equivalent to C satisfying A shifted over phi. So it's a kind of a partial evaluation. I know already that I will evaluate my condition on arrow starting with phi. So I shift it and kind of pre-compute this, this condition. And um, OK, what we have in the paper actually uh, is this result. Um, that this shift uh, is part of an adjunction. So now we also have um, existential quantification, universal quantification, which you saw, just means putting an existential and universal quantifier in front of a condition. And usually um, these quantifiers arise as adjoints in categorical logic. So it was quite natural to look here what is the adjunction. And the adjunction is with the shift operation. So uh, shift here is a uh, right adjoint to um, existential quantification, which is the left, and here's the other way around. So if you don't know that much about adjunction, uh, think of the as Galois connections, which might be known from, from program analysis. So a Galois connection between two lattices, and here the lattices uh, are the sets of all condition uh, with uh, Boolean or and uh, Boolean and. Okay, this is a, just a theoretical result, but uh, nice, and of course you can uh, derive several laws for this logic. For instance, the usual quantifier distribution law holds for all distributes over um, and uh, the shift distributes over both should be because it's a left and a right adjoint, but this is also easy to prove otherwise. And then there's also this bit uh, slightly more unusual quantifier distribution law, so you can do a bit of uh, uh, laws and equivalences with this logic. Okay, now the applications. And... Um, we had two, uh, have two applications in this paper, and the first is uh, on computing pre- and post-conditions. Uh, so again, there's a rule with a condition, and let be a condition on arrows with the source subject zero. So just a condition on, think of that condition of co-spans, which are conditions on graphs, for instance, which tell you something is the property of the graph. And then when you apply a rule, you want to know what is um, the strongest post-condition, that the graph satisfy, the graphs that you reach satisfy afterwards. And if you have a backwards, you want to know the weakest precondition. So weakest precondition of a rule for a condition B is computed as follows. Um, so for all left-hand sides that you might have, if, um, if um, the remaining context satisfies C, um, th this implies that the context must satisfy B if you put R in front. Well, this is what it means um, to have a weakest precondition. And the strongest postcondition says there exists a right-hand side. Okay, you just applied the rules. There should be a right-hand side such that the context uh, satisfies C. And if you put in front the left-hand side again, what you have uh, satisfies A. And, um, okay, this looks quite natural. And, um, but we ha you have to s look what um, people have done in the graph transformation literature. And there are all these constructions, but it typically it takes two or three pages to construct these things with lots of operations. And we find now that this is somehow a nice high-level representation of what you get there. Okay, so another application is um, confluence. I mean, we are doing here abstract high-level, some high-level rewriting. So, of course, we want to do all the stuff that you'd usually like to do with rewriting all the in the, also in this setting. And... Um, Okay, we want to uh, analyze local confluence, of course. I mean, if, you know, if your system is locally confluent and terminates, then it is confluent. 
And we do this via the usual critical pair analysis. That means look for overlapping left-hand sides. So just overlap your left-hand sides. And in this thing that you get, which consists of two overlapping left-hand left sides, you apply both rules, well, apply the rules and get the, what you get after inserting the right-hand sides. And then I show that after potentially any number of steps, you are, you're confident. So you reach the same, same error afterwards. And uh, of course, the question is, what are the critical pairs here? And the critical pairs, as we found, are just these representative squares. Um, so the rewriting relation is locally confident if and only if for every pair of left-hand sides in all representative ways to close these left-hand sides. There exists an arrow D such that you can reduce um, here and here. And you end up in the, in the same error. And this is an if and only if result, as in, in term rewriting, string rewriting, you have it is confluent if and only if it satisfies this, uh, this property. OK. And then, OK, this is about conditions, conditional reactive systems. So we wanted to do the same with conditions. And actually, there is a predecessor work on graph transformation system, which has a similar idea. And we kind of adapted it, generalized it a bit, and especially moved it to this more um, abstract setting. And OK, this, is a bit, this looks a bit. Uh, more difficult. So rewriting relation is loaded confident if, no if and only if, unfortunately, we thought about it. But we have some examples which show that if and only if is probably a bit tough, not really possible. Um, for every pair of left-hand sides and all representative ways to close this pair, OK, now there exists now several arrows to which you can reduce. Why several? Because you have conditions. And if the context satisfies some condition, you might be able to reduce to this one. But if it satisfies some other condition, you might be able to reduce to some other arrow. So several. And conditions, so that, that under these conditions, you can make the reductions to the di. And this condition, now what does it mean? Since you know that both rules were applicable, you know that the context satisfies these conditions. Um, <coughs> this implies the disjunction, so at least one of the pairs of conditions that guarantee confluence has to be, has to be satisfied. So, and here, um, AI uh, denotes the application conditions of these two rules move to the joint, to move to their joint interface. And this means that under this condition, A can reduce to B. It might not be in general able to, A might not be in general able to reduce to B because the context might have some inhibiting conditions. Especially with these conditions, you can express things like that certain things should not be there. And if they are there, they might inhibit uh, the reductions. So if, I, no, the intuition, but I already stated this basically, if under the condition that both rules can be applied, we can at least one po find one less possibility to close the diamond, then the system is locally confident. And there might be several different ways to join the diamond. And on, in only one direction, no if and only. OK, so now I should say a bit about um, related work, because um, this is really based on a lot of stuff. And we kind of pulled it together and packaged it into this framework. And uh, nested application conditions in graph writing have been studied quite a bit. Um, actually, I have to be um, fair and say it's not just graph writing, but it's also some categorical form of rewriting. But let's say I think that's based still very similar to graph writing. And then basically, we're one step more abstract here. Um, then we did uh, this weakest precondition and strongest postconditions in high level transformation systems. These are this form of um, double push out rewriting, have already been studied in, by Hubble and Penemann. And then the idea to compare these conditions to first order graph logic is by Rensing from 2004. Um, the local confluence for graph transformation system without condition is from Plum, by Plum. And with conditions, as I just said, we took the special case, and which was, is from uh, 2010, and generalized it now to this setting. And things, I think that were really took some pages to express in these papers. Now you can write in a few lines. And um, yeah, we also had heavy uh, some inspiration from categorical logic, especially to look for this adjunction that is because they usually exist in, in categorical logic. And um, so, OK, what else do we have in mind? So um, the reason why we looked into this was really that we came from the, from the area of deriving labeled uh, transition systems, behavioral equivalences. And um, 
we want it to do it with conditions. I mean, why? Okay, it's nice here, but actually we really have some very tough um, uh, case studies, which we looked at to um, verify, and this, especially from the area of model transformation. So we have some people who bring us case studies from the area of model transformation. You want to transform some model, sometimes they're a bit UML-like, PetriNet models, whatever, into another model, and you want to show that uh, some kind of behavior is preserved. And these model transformation rules always have conditions, always, all the time. So you cannot really deal with rules who do not have conditions. If you come more from process algebra, you might think, my conditions really don't need them. But if you look into this application area, they're, they're abundant. And the other thing is now that we can uh, compute the pre and post conditions, we could, in principle, implement this for the special case of graph transformation and do some kind of SIGAR, so count example guided abstraction refinement framework. Uh, with predicate abstraction for graph transformation. So we haven't done this yet. This is an idea. So many steps are, have been taken, but of course it's not clear whether the results will be good. And of course in order to do this, I mean because we also have to, in mind to implement this, we have to solve one small problem. And uh, of course this is a first order logic. And the entailment problem is undecidable. So in order to get around to this, we actually I, either can actually restrict to a simpler logic or there actually have been already quite successful attempts, especially in the PhD thesis of Penemann, uh, to do this in an approximative way, so that you actually can reason with such logics, despite the undecidability. Okay, and that's it, and thank you much for your attention.